Good afternoon to you in St. Lucia and across the Caribbean and beyond. Welcome to this special discussion program linked to the 40th regular meeting of CARICOM Heads of Government. You may be aware that the Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community are in St. Lucia. They've been here for the last two days and they continue to meet tomorrow as they look at matters related to the development of the Caribbean community and ways to bring benefits to you, the people of the Caribbean. We thought that as we work along with the meeting that we will have an engagement with you, the people of the community, to hear from you and to speak to you about benefits and challenges of regional integration. And so we decided to have this special program this afternoon and to give you a chance to reach us and to air your questions and your concerns. My name is Kendall Morgan. I'm the Head of Communications at the CARICOM Secretariat. And I'm joined on the panel by three gentlemen. And uh, I'll let them tell you a bit more about themselves, but let me just introduce them. Starting to my far left, I have the Ambassador of Barbados to CARICOM, Mr. David Comijong. And to his right, Mr. Felix Gregoire, who is Dominica's ambassador to CARICOM. And to my immediate left, Mr. Gordon Charles, who is a representative of the organizing group of the Caribbean Private Sector Organization. And before we get to you and hear the matters that you would want to hear about and to discuss, I'd ask the gentlemen on the panel to tell us a bit about themselves and the roles that they perform in relation to what's happening regionally. And uh, I'll start in the middle and ask Mr. Gregoire to go first and uh, ask him to tell us a bit about himself and uh, about the role that he performs as Dominica's ambassador to CARICOM. Okay, good afternoon to um, our listeners and thank you, um, Mr. Moderator. Um, as you said, I'm Ambassador Felix Gregoire. I have worked in the public service for quite a long time, and I retired as the secretary to the cabinet in 2012. And in 2013, I became um, the Dominica's ambassador to CARICOM. Um, at that time, CARICOM had started a reform program, and um, the ambassadors then were called the change, change agents because they played a part in more or less steering the, the reform process at CARICOM. Um, that brought us the, the strategic plan um, that CARICOM adopted sometime in 2014 or 2013. And um, also there, there were changes in terms of staff at the secretariat. So I was involved in that at the early stages. Um, I'll say more about um, what CARICOM has done and what role I've played. But I'd also like to say that I was the vice president of the Renault Islands Cricket Board. And that's, we're talking regional integration and cricket is, is a very important tool in our, um, in our efforts to, to unify ourselves and to work as a team. So I was part of the Renault Islands Cricket Board. And today, um, the West Indies team beat um, Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, so which means they, they won their first match and, the and their last match. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to, um, to the team progressing from there on. Right. So um, having said that, um, I will just like to close here and um, okay. come back later. Right, we'll expand a bit more. And uh, the, so that's uh, uh, an ambassador that is linked from, to the, from the national to the regional. I want to invite Mr. Gordon Charles, who is to my immediate left, to tell us about himself before we get into the depth of the discussions. Okay, so my, my um, regular responsibility is as the CEO of uh, the J.K. Charles Group of Companies that operates um, in St. Lucia, um, primarily in St. Lucia. Um, it's um, 
somewhat diversified in the areas of retail um, and um, real estate um, with some finance as well and um, that's as I say what my my regular um, responsibility is but my presence here comes more from that of being involved in the OECS Business Council in the first instance, mm -hmm. um, which uh, was formulated um, some years ago and has been somewhat dormant recently. But subsequent to the um, initiative of, um, of the CARICOM heads um, in inviting the private sector to participate in the CSME, um, through the OECS Business Council, I was contacted and asked if I would represent the OECS or be the OECS representative um, of the group that was coming together to form this entity. So that, that um, is what um, initiated my presence here right. today. Okay, and uh, we do have uh, quite a lot to talk about the private sector and its role in regional development. But let's hear from Mr. David Kamijang about himself. Uh, he's probably a, a well-known figure to you across the Caribbean, but uh, I'm sure there'll be more that he can say about himself, Mr. Kamajong. Thank you, Kendo. Well, I come very much from a Caribbean integration family. My father was a Methodist minister of religion, so if you know anything about the Methodist church in the Caribbean, they, they move all around the region. So uh, my father was from Grenada. I was born in St. Vincent. I also lived in Trinidad and um, in Barbados. I have brothers from, born in Guyana, Trinidad, um, St. Vincent, and my mother was born in Barbados, but grew up in Guyana. So I have lived that Caribbean integration experience. Um, I'm an attorney at law, and for most of my working life, I have worked in Barbados doing law, but also very much involved in political activism, very much involved in Pan-Africanism, um, Caribbean integration as, as an activist. And um, recently, over the past year, I have taken up a position with the new uh, Mia Motley administration in Barbados as Barbados's ambassador to CARICOM and to the Association of Caribbean states. So that's what brings me here to this 40th CARICOM Heads of Government Conference. Okay, thank you very much. Now to you viewing across the region and beyond, I will, I will start the discussion with a few questions, but the program really belongs to you and we'd want to hear from, from you, those of you following us on the Facebook pages on which we are streaming, the CARICOM Facebook page, the Government of St. Lucia Facebook page, and UE TV Facebook page. You can send your queries, your questions, and we will present them to the panel. We've also, we're having this discussion in the media center for the CARICOM Heads of Government meeting, so we've asked the accredited media representatives who are here to uh, field questions as well, and so you will most likely be hearing from them. I want to begin with Mr. Gregor again, and to ask, in your, in your role as, as Dominica's ambassador to CARICOM, and your engagement with the people of Dominica and the rest of the region, um, are you able to see benefits from the country's participation in the regional project? And if so, um, can you identify what some of those are and also what sort of challenges do you see from time to time in um, the attempt to deliver these benefits? Okay, thank you. Um, as the ambassador to, to CARICOM, um, in Dominica we have what we call a regional integration and diaspora unit. And I am also head of that unit. So what that means is that in addition to operating at the level, at the regional level, I also have a role to play at the national level. Because in all what we do, um, and we have been talking about decisions taken by heads over the years, 
and the slow pace of implementation of those decisions. Um, we forget that member states are responsible for implementing those decisions. So the heads will take a decision to the benefit of the citizens. But if we, as um, officials, do not implement those decisions, then we do not move forward. So, so at each level or in each country, um, there must be an institution to carry out the functions uh, based on decisions taken. And um, that is what I've been involved in. Um, for example, one of the things that I saw was lacking was that the man on the street was not too aware of the role of CARICOM. So while we take all those decisions, but the people, man on the street may not know what benefit he can derive from such a decision. And my unit with others undertook a program of, of education. And we had town hall meetings. We went into the school system to actually sensitize young and old about CARICOM and what CARICOM has done and how they can benefit from CARICOM. And one of the, one of the things I found interesting was that um, when I said that every member or every citizen was a member of CARICOM, uh, people didn't quite understand that. So I said, well, look, do you have a passport? And they said, yes. And then the passport is a CARICOM passport. So there you are, you're a CARICOM citizen because you have a CARICOM passport. So these are the tangible, tangible benefits that you can, you can actually, people can relate to. Yeah. And because you have that passport, you can travel. I uh, will hear more about the CSME um, later, but that's one of the products of the CSME that you can travel from one country to the next country and you get automatic stay for six months. So there's no, the whole idea to have travel, um, hassle-free travel. So you move in and the immigration officer is not supposed to be asking you the questions you, you used to hear before. Yeah. Where you going to stay? Um, where's your return ticket and stuff like that? You move into a, a member state and then you get an automatic six month stay. And then, the, of course, if you stay longer than six months, you can. There are other uh, provisions you can use um, to either continue or renew your stay, extend your stay. And if you want to work, then you have their provisions for you to work. And you do not need a work permit if you have the skill certificate. So these are the tangible benefits. And um, there are quite a few I can we have two hours, so maybe I can take a little time. Um, for example, Dominica was hit by, was hit by a disaster, or, uh, 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 we call it different names, but a monstrous uh, storm, Hurricane Maria. And from our point in Dominica, the assistance we got from the CARICOM national, um, CARICOM um, countries, sisters and brothers, was tremendous. Um, I don't think we would have been able to recover so quickly if we did not, did not have the support of our brothers and sisters in the, in the Caribbean. First of all, as soon as we got hit, um, all the governments pledged a certain amount of money to Dominica. That's the first thing. Then we had Difficulties at home in terms of food supplies. Um, we got a tremendous amount of, 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 of water and food from our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean. Another interesting thing was the, because of the scale of the disaster, our security forces could not manage the situation on the ground. And the RSS came in. The RSS is, is, a, is a product of CARICOM, came in 
and assist, assisted our security people to, to put law and order so that the citizens could go about their business in, in, a, in a satisfactory manner. So these are all the benefits that we can derive from, um, and there are quite a few of uh, other, other benefits which will come, but um, I just want to say that again, we as nationals have responsibilities and we have to do what is necessary to implement the decisions um, taken by our heads because we cannot leave it to the secretariat that's based in Guyana to do all those things. We have to play our part. And uh, a very important stakeholder in implementing decisions because they're the ones who do the trading. Uh, the uh, business people, the private sector. And uh, I note, Mr. Charles, that uh, there is an attempt at creating a, a regional entity, the Caribbean Private Sector Organization. Can you tell us a bit, a, a bit more about, um, about that effort? Okay. This um, effort firstly was spawned through um, or from the Caribbean heads. Um, this is all part of the um, CSME initiative that it was identified that um, engaging the private sector would be um, who are primarily the engines of um, of growth across the region um, would be um, of certainly value to the process. So through um, Prime Minister Motley, who is the, the, the chairhead for the CSME initiative, um, she decided to reach out to um, primarily, uh, initially to a, a, num a series of um, larger companies across the region, um, directly to the, the owners of, of capital and business w across the region. So you have larger companies like um, Ansa Makal and, and, um, and Muslims and so on uh, in Jamaica um, and uh, Goddard's in Barbados. So across the region, she reached out to a, a, a range of companies and said, um, invited them to come together and create some sort of Caribbean private sector organization, basically. And um, the private sector took up the challenge. Um, um, as I say, I came via the, um, my invitation was really through the OECS, representing the OECS, um, but took up the challenge. Um, and this was, um, the first meeting was held in in Trinidad and the St. Anne's meeting in December of love 2018, where we got together and we um, decided, yes, we would um, um, take up the challenge. We see the obvious, the obvious synergies um, and benefits that we can both part, um, um, provide and also derive from CSME and from um, being um, a part of its implementation. So, the committee, what we call the organizi organizing group, um, uh, formed a small committee and started looking at um, how we create an organization. Um, we brought on board a consultant, a consulting firm, a regional consulting firm, um, who helped guide us through the process. Um, and um, have had a series of, of back meetings, so to speak, until we've gotten to the point now where we had capacity now to present to the CARICOM heads and to the, the conference um, our proposal for creating this initiative. Um, there is certainly um, value. We feel that um, there are three primary things that will benefit from this. Um, one is that um, if we can get involved directly, it should help maximize the use of labor mm -hmm. across the region because the companies are now looking at how we can move um, labor and human resources across the territories um, so that where there are needs and gaps that they can be filled from other territories. Um, two, to also be able to maximize the other resources, whether it is capital or, or natural resources that, that exist across the region. Um, and I, I heard mentioned this morning um, in, in our conversation, so where products could possibly be um, um, grown in one territory but sent to another for, for processing 
where there's much, uh, a much greater capacity for processing or lower costs of, of, of energy. And three is to, in the long run, try and make our region so much more self-sufficient, um, both from um, um, a provision of food services to, to the region, so we, we, can, we can decrease our import bills across the region, but also in everything that we do, if we can be much more efficient, um, the private sector can, then there's definitely a benefit to the region. And by direct response, there's a direct benefit to the, the private sector organizations itself. So that's why we feel that um, it, you know, it, we, will, we welcome the opportunity to participate um, because we do see that the, the whole initi initiative and drive of CSME is one that is definitely um, where we think the region should, should enter. You, you did a presentation to the heads of government today. Um, did you get a, a sense that um, they're ready to work along with the private sector at this um, point? Um, without fear of, of, of putting anyone else on the spot, I would say yes. Um, I think that the, the work that has been done was fairly comprehensive and self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, it is very structured. And in our presentation today, um, we were able to lay out not just the, the, the goals and aims, but um, our internal structure that we expect, um, you know, how we ex um, where we expect to be seated, and um, some of the initial initiatives that we think we should um, ach achieve, etc. Mm -hmm. And also to provide a sense of comfort and confidence that that the focus of inclusion, which is by the very nature of what CSME is, and the fact that we ourselves were invited and included into this process, our efforts have been one of open inclusion and broad um, um, diversification so that the, the membership potential and access to the proposed entity, the, the CARICOM private sector organ organization, is not one that will be purely for the big boys across the region or to, to, to favor certain people. Everyone has access. Obviously, there will be very varying levels mm -hmm. um, depending on, on one, your input and also um, your opportunities. But the idea is that it's to create an organization that will really reach across the region and across the various sizes of, of um, businesses. So whether you're a large, large regional entity or a small um, a small business across the region, there are avenues in which you can participate and be a part of this organization. Okay. So, Kwame Jung, some people say that the CARICOM concept is just a, a, a romantic vision for some people who see themselves as regionalists, but that it is not a, a practical approach or feasible approach to really developing the region. Um, well, I know as the ambassador you're going to be an advocate, but you've been in the, in the, in, 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 in the regional business for, for quite a while. What would you say to someone who genuinely feels that way? Well, I see regional integration as something that is very central to the social transformation of our people. It's not, regional integration is not only about economics. I mean, we understood, we understood a long time ago that those entities that were intent on oppressing and exploiting our people brought most of our ancestors across the Atlantic deposited them on separate small islands and proceeded to exploit them, to keep them separate, to keep them weak so that they could be fodder for exploitation. We understand that our first emancipatory step was the breaking down of that system of slavery. And how did we do it? <laughs> we did it by original enterprise. We didn't accomplish it in our individual territories. It was, it was the combination of slave rebellions right across this region from Haiti to, to Dominica to Jamaica to Barbados in 1816 and 
Demerara in 1823, and Jamaica in 1832. So from, from the very earliest time, I can tell you in Barbados, our, one of our national heroes, um, Samuel Jackman Prescott, the first black man to enter the House of Assembly way back in the 1830s. One of the first roles he played was to try, uh, when slavery was abolished, to try to bring together what he called the colonial union of colored people. In other words, even, even back then, there was a recognition that for us to be the people that we ought to be, for us to have our full freedom um, that, we needed, that we needed to come together and to unite our resources and to, de to develop that, um, that collective strength. And this has been a guiding vision. We go back to the um, 1940s when out of the disturbances of the 30s we formed the Caribbean Labor Congress. What was the idea? The idea was if we want to be a real people, if we want to have independence, if we want to have genuine sovereignty and nationhood, that we needed to come together and the first our first concept was that we come together in a federation um, we did that um, unfortunately it collapsed after four four years but the idea had taken root that if we wanted to be a real nation a people if we wanted to break the bonds of economic and social and political dependency that had been foisted upon us in, that, um, in those centuries of colonialism and slavery, that we could not do it individually. We had to come together and unite our strengths. And so um, the, prime, the Premier of, of, of Barbados fought very hard after the breakup of the Federation, Errol Barrow, um, the, the effort at establishing the Federation of the Little Eight, um, and eventually that they weren't able to do so. But by 1965, the three of them, Barrow in Barbados, um, Bird in Antigua, Burnham in Guyana, were able to come together and to, re to, to resuscitate that federationist movement, this time not through a political entity, but through this process of regional economic integration. And so we were clear, we were clear. Look, if we want to break out of the bonds of economic dependency, um, bar businesses in Barbados needed a bigger market than the island, than the simple island market of Barbados. So Barbadian manufacturers, Barbadian businesses needed to have at their disposal a wider regional market. Similarly, if we, if we really want to be independent people, there are certain um, institutions we need to establish, whether it's a university, whether it is um, a, a court system, whether it is a mechanism for responding to, to regional disasters, and it's difficult to do these things singly. If we come together regionally, we can combine our, our resources and what we can't accomplish as a small island nation, we could accomplish within uh, a larger pooling of resources. So the point I'm trying to make is Caribbean integration is not simply about economic matters. It is not simply about matters of trade. Uh, it is about a people finding their sovereignty, a people coming together in a structure large enough, powerful enough for them to stand tall on the world stage, um, for them to be respected, on the world stage and for, for, for them to give to the masses of our people a, a mechanism for social transformation. The colonial and slavery system said that the life expectancies of our people was to be very narrow, very confined. So we put you on little Montserrat and you remain there and your destiny is to be there, and you dare not move off of that little island unless somebody gave you permission to move and seek a, a, a wider destiny for yourself. And we said, no, we are going to give to our people a, a whole region in which to find their destiny, a whole region 
in which to search out life and career opportunities for themselves. What, what are we doing? We are launching a psychological liberatory emancipatory experience. And so I want to insist that when we talk about um, Caribbean integration, we don't simply restrict it to some narrow issue of trade and economics. We see it in its widest dimension as the instrument that gives us national sovereignty, independence, um, dignity, and provides an avenue for social transformation and the liberation of our people. Thank you. And the, well, Mr. Gregor had actually touched on some of the, the wider platforms on which the integration process demonstrates itself in the form of, of benefits going using the Dominica experience. But there are a number of institutions. Um, he could have mentioned perhaps CXC as an example. We've all, well, maybe it's been up to some of our times mm -hmm. and we did, some of us did GC, but a lot of uh, our younger viewers would have done CXC, for instance. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's part of the, the CARICOM makeup. Mm -hmm. um, CDEMA helps the countries which are, are uh, um, devastated by, by hurricanes and also to uh, help them to, um, to prepare themselves properly to prevent um, the disaster um, impacting at its worst. So that um, there are these mechanisms through which the benefits can be demonstrated. I don't know if Mr. Gregor wants to pick up on that and expand a bit. Well, yes, um, it, it's always important to refresh um, the minds because we take those things for granted. We know about UE, we know about CXC, we know about CDEMA, uh, we know about CADI, agriculture, and we don't seem to relate those things to, to CARICOM and the wider integration movement. So it's always good to, to do that. And uh, in recent times, and, and uh, David mentioned legal aspects, we had the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice. And um, we are struggling in some respects because not all countries have um, signed up to make it the final court of appeal. But um, all of them have, in fact, signed up to it. Um, in, 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 some, in, some, in some way. But the CCJ is there to replace the Privy Council. And um, if David had to talk about the Privy Council, mm -hmm. you would hear his views about the colonial masters. Um, but we've replaced the, the Privy Council with CCJ, which is closer to, to uh, the citizens. So instead of going to London for justice, you, you, you go to Trinidad. And not only go to Trinidad, the CCG also comes to the territories, the member states. So they hold hearings, they have um, court sessions in the member states so that um, you don't have to move if, if the CCG comes to, to, to your members, to, to your country. So we have the CCG, um, which is very important um, to us in terms of, of, of legal matters. So, yeah, all those even in health, I mean, health is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we have CAFA based in Trinidad. And, and I'm saying health, but mm -hmm. let me relate health to, 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 to an example. When, when we were threatened with Ebola um, a few years ago, uh, I'm sure most of us um, we were panicking because we didn't know what, how we were going to deal with, with Ebola. Mm -hmm. But then regionally, we came up with measures so we could deal with Ebola. And, and I, I have to mention um, the government of Cuba gave us tremendous support when we were looking at how we could deal with putting mechanisms in place to deal with Ebola. Um, there are other threats as well um, oh, um, in recent times. So all these are uh, institutions that we mm -hmm. have there mm -hmm. to assist us. Mm -hmm. I mentioned CADI. CADI is, mm -hmm. is, is on a, um, in, an institution dealing with agriculture. 
And in all the countries, the, we have agriculture being practiced um, because of, of um, the land resources that we have. So, so Cardi has been doing that. But while I'm saying that, I, I need to, to, to say that generally, generally, um, we are getting into a situation where we are not doing research, uh, not only in agriculture, but in other, other disciplines as well. Um, for some reason, uh, we do not pay too much attention to research. And research is very important because based on our findings, we can take informed decisions. So I'm just saying that that's one challenge we're having now because we are not paying attention to research. Mm -hmm. uh, research is tedious, it is a long-term thing, and uh, most of us like to see quick results. You want to see the thing now. And not everything you can see, you can see now. Um, for example, um, we have had those disasters in the region. Uh, our ecosystems have been affected. Forests have been um, destroyed. The marine life affected. And we have now a platform to start research programs to see how those ecosystems are, are coming back, how the repair is being done, so that in the future, um, when we have those disasters, we know what to expect. Uh, I'm saying so because um, I've, I'm, I'm an office, I, dealt, I, did, I worked with the Ministry of Agriculture. Actually, I used to be the Director of Forest and Wildlife. And um, I, I have seen a number of things over the years. And I would like to see the continuation of some of those things. Um, I can relate some of those things to, um, like in St. Lucia, you have a parrot. Um, it's only found in St. Lucia. Um, in Dominica, we have two parrots, only found in Dominica. And if we had a disaster to wipe out our parrots, what, do we, what would happen? So we have to put measures in place. And the measures, they, some things are being done, but um, there's more we could do. And I think right now, given this situation, we should step up on our research um, activities. And so that's mm -hmm. reference to CADI, but I'm just broadening it to, to, the to other, other areas. Okay. I'm going to pick up on uh, something that Mr. Gordon raised in terms of the uh, umbrella private sector organization providing perhaps the business environment to uh, support the, the small businesses, not just deal with the, the larger ones. Um, because now we have um, a, a, an attempt at pushing entrepreneurship and getting younger people into businesses and so on, and we're telling them the, 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 the region is, is, is your marketplace. Uh, so to what extent do you see that the working together of the private sector aiding in that push that is being made to encourage our young people into business? The whole thrust and focus of, um, of the private sector at this level is for the strengthening of CSME. Right. Um, and as I, as I related earlier, um, it is to see that we can maximize the employment and maximize the use of our resources. So directly there, this creates the format or the link or the forum, I should say, at which the policies that govern some of the things that the, that the region does, um, which, which, which is done at a CARICOM level, it means now that the private sector is going to be, um, if, a, if adopted, at the table and allowed to participate um, um, in, the policy in the policy making. Um, this has two benefits. One, um, um, it can benefit from the experience that, um, that um, we can bring to the table with regard to, to the business and, and to the economics of the region. And two, it means that this institution can take that information directly now and see how it can turn it around and drive it down into the, the individual member states through the organizations that, that feed up into 
the, the, the CARICOM private sector organization. So it's an opportunity, and, and as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there are various categories of, of participation, um, right down to very small businesses. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, right um, coming out of our meeting, we had um, um, uh, just an initial and informal conversation with CDB um, in, excuse me, in which um, they indicated that there is potentially um, soft funding available for exactly those sorts of initiatives to find ways um, for the smaller enterprises to get up and running. Um, but very often there's a big disconnect between those opportunities that, that exist at the CARICOM level and that that is apparent at the small operating businesses. So one of our roles would be to make sure that we create that link mm -hmm. to bring the private sector, regardless of its size, um, to bring rather the initiatives and opportunities that exist in CARICOM to the private sector. There's a sense that uh, some of the, even the larger companies are comfortable with their national market and national operations and that even if the uh, provisions are made for the creation of a regional market that um, there wouldn't be a lot of uh, uptake on that. Um, what's the feeling of the members of the private sector organization on that? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking, you know, we talk about um, how we have formed this, the CCJ and um, CADI and all these things where uh, we have regional integration. There is a lot of re private sector integration behind the scenes. So there are lots of, of um, companies that are operating, not just coming in into territories, but, but through private sector deals, so on business to business, making arrangements and partnerships um, to be able to bring their products to the different territories and so on. So that already happens, as from, from my perspective, um, I'm quite significantly in the background. And I'm not just talking about um, large entities buying into small, into small regions. I'm mm. talking about um, truly where there are synergies that are put potentially, because we see the, op the op opportunities of, of a wider region. Mm -hmm. um, the economies of scale limit us all. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you can have that wider market, there's an, always an opportunity. But it's not necessarily one way um, one entity has to get it. So you partner with someone in another ter ter territory who brings certain skills or assets or, 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 or availability to, to your venture, and you do it jointly. Mm -hmm. So that is already happening on an, on, on, I would say on, a, on an increasingly ongoing basis across the region as companies are seeing opportunities and seeing exactly that. How can I widen my footprint? Um, and um, you do so by, um, by partnering. So that is already happening in the private sector, but on a, on a much more quiet basis, it's, it's, it's filtering. What about uh, the, with regard to um, sourcing skills um, for, uh, 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 is that readily available in the region? Um, okay, so that's that's one of the challenges, and I, ironically, um, one of one of our members of the organizing um, committee just mentioned to me last night that he actually has his um, his HR person down in Trinidad looking for a resource that is scarce in his region. He's hoping he says if he can get fifteen engineers, for yeah. example, yeah. Um, um, right now out of Trinidad because the the industry down there is a little bit low and there's, there's available um, a capacity, mm -hmm. whereas he doesn't have that capacity um, um, from from his territory. Um, so he's now looking for it. But that is one of the things, and that's why I, I um, was mentioning in an earlier um, interview, one of the, the um, immediate wins that we were asked to look at is actually the whole concept about the free movement of labor. And we have, from the word go, endorsed it because we realize that you will, you will always potentially have a mismatch of, of capacity versus opportunity in any region, in any uh, particular state within the region. Right, and, uh, and the opportunity now is to make it as free-flowing as possible so that someone from um, one territory can pick up and go across to another um, because there is a, a need there that they have the, the, the training or capac capacity to fulfill. Yeah. And um, um, these are the sorts of things that we feel that can start to happen and we can get wins from as quickly as possible as long as the CARICOM heads agree 
to the opening and the widening of the, the free movement because that is something that would limit at this point in time right. um, the, the easier movements. I want to hear from uh, two ambassadors about the free movement uh, matter because it seems to be, well, from, 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 from where I sit, uh, a lot of the queries relate to that. But I, I, I want to pa pause for us to, to take in, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be taking questions from uh, viewers across the region who are following our, our stream. Yeah. And uh, Ms. Uh, Janet Carew of UE TV has been monitoring. Janet? Thank you very much. Uh, panelists, I have a question here from Claire Palmer. And she asked, with the exodus of nurses from the Caribbean, do the heads of government have anything positive in the pipeline to encourage nurses to stick around the region? That's one. And on the CARICOM website, um, the question was, what is the status of the reparations movement in the region? Thank you. OK, well, let's begin with nurses. So <laughs> on the panel, we'll take that, or, uh, or do we? I don't know that there's I don't know that there will be anything done to um, to um, hold our nurses in in the region I but I, what I do know is that efforts are going to be made um, to increase our capacity to educate and train nurses mm -hmm. as we know um, one of the more recent developments in our region is that we are on the verge of um, constructing, establishing um, a fourth campus, a fifth campus of the University of the West Indies in Antigua. And one of the areas of specialization of that campus is going to be yes. in the, the training of nurses. Um, so, so yes, so we, um, obviously, there are many developed countries that um, uh, have a great interest in our nurses, offer them um, better, maybe better salaries than we can, we can pay and entice them away. Um, so much so that in Barbados we are now looking to Ghana to help us with nurses. But the regional movement is responding to the situation by putting new capacity in place to, to, train, to train nurses. And the CARICOM skills um, program um, includes nurses as one of the categories of skills that is permitted to move freely across the region. So um, our, there's, there's a, nurses are being encouraged. Um, we recognize that it's, it's a valuable skill and our heads of government in their wisdom have selected nurses as one of the 12 categories that have thus far um, been identified as those persons who should be permitted to move freely across the region. So far as reparations is concerned, um, reparations is a big topic now all over the world. Oh. Um, in fact, just about a week ago, we had the spectacle of uh, congressional hearings in the US Congress mm -hmm. on the topic of reparations. And I can tell you that the impetus for, for that development in the United States stemmed directly from CARICOM establishing its um, CARICOM Reparations Commission in 2013 and um, embarking upon um, this quest for reparatory justice. Um, so a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the recent running on reparations has really been done by, by CARICOM. Um, with the change of government in Barbados um, last year, Prime Minister Motley has taken up responsibility as the Prime Minister with lead responsibility for reparations. Um, she hasn't been able to do much on that score thus far. I mean, her hands have been really full, um, what with um, having to negotiate an IMF program for Barbados, uh, you know, taking over a Barbados um, in, in, in some sort of crisis and having to shepherd it over the past over the past year, having to deal with the CSME lead responsibility for the CSME, and then the hot potato issue of of Venezuela that landed on her plate as one of the trio of prime ministers who was given responsibility for the issue of Venezuela. So she has really had her plate very full. But I know that um, very soon from now, 
she will be turning her formidable energy and um, intellect to the to her portfolio as lead um, prime minister for for reparations. So I think I think CARICOM must be given tremendous credit for taking up the reparations cause for recognizing that. <laughs> that we of all people, I mean, if there's one set of people in this world that should see itself as the champions of dignity and justice for, for African people, um, it, it, really must be, it really must be us. And I think we have done well in stepping forward, taking up that responsibility, and sparking now what is virtually, um, what is promising to be a worldwide movement. So I would say that, um, the, the future is bright for the reparations cause. I think more and more um, all over the world, um, we are coming to a common understanding that where these terrible crimes against humanity were um, committed, where people have suffered um, from those crimes, that there must, be, there must be an effort to repair the damage. It touches on the issue of uh strength in numbers generally and um, maybe it is something that we should seek to emphasize through examples that there have been instances where the numerical strength of the the CARICOM membership has 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 worked to the benefit of the region can you expand a bit on that as well oh, oh def uh, definitely I mean you know, CARICOM, you know, we need to be very clear. CARICOM is about free trade. It is about providing um, opportunities for, for free movement of our people. It is about these um, extremely valuable um, institutions that we have built, that uh, things that we need if we are to fuel our development, if we are to be a real nation, and that we could not do on our own. Um, Barbados, for example, probably could not have um, its own university. But, so we have functional cooperation, we have the trade, we have um, the free movement, the functional cooperation, but we also have the collective foreign policy. And I think maybe the best example of where that collective strength uh, made itself felt was in 1972 when um, the United States and the OAS had totally isolated the Caribbean nation of Cuba. Totally isolated. Everybody broke diplomatic relations with Cuba. And um, it took four courageous CARICOM states, um, or states that in 1972 had just made that fatal, that, that um, all-important decision to transform um, CARIFTA into CARICOM. And it was at the same conference that that decision was made that these four, four, four Caribbean states, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Barbados, made a decision that collectively they were going to break the diplomatic isolation of Cuba and collectively um, recognize Cuba and establish normal um, diplomatic and economic relations with Cuba. And they did it in the face of great opposition from the mighty United States of America. Now, no, no one of them by themselves hmm. might have had the gumption Courage. or the power um, to do it, but coming together as a foursome, they were able to do it collectively. And you know what happened? As soon as they made that courageous four-pronged step, <laughs> the rest of the hemisphere fell in line. All these big countries that felt that they had to follow the dictates of the U.S. and isolate Cuba recognized that, no, this, um, these four Caribbean countries made sense, that, um, that Cuba was part of our family of nations, and we should have normal um, intercourse with, with, with Cuba. So that, that is a very... Um, tell an example. Mm -hmm. um, other examples could be um, the role that we played as part of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group of nations in negotiating the first Lome um, con uh, convention 
with what was then the European um, economic uh, community. So, and, and again, in more recent times, Venezuela. Uh -huh. Venezuela. <laughs> Um, we have learnt that, um, you know, when we come together and act in concert, that we wield substantial power. Indeed. And, and um, what we have done recently in, in insisting to the world that, no, um, we can't just be about, uh, you know, civil war in Venezuela and invading Venezuela. No, no, no. Um, we, we must insist, and we do so collectively, that the rules of international law, the principles of international law must be respected. And I think we can see that um, CARICOM has actually won the argument because more and more countries all over the world are coming, uh, coming around to that position that CARICOM took collectively. And, and perhaps if we had to do it as individual countries, we would not have been able to do it. If I may just add something from a, from a slightly different perspective. You talked about the, what we, the perceived brain drain in terms of our nurses um, traveling because of better opportunities outside the region that are better. That is a fact. Um, I can see in St. Lucia we um, we, are, we plagued with that as well. Um, at a, even at, at a corporate level, um, you have a challenge finding um, pharmacists, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all the things, but that, that in itself will create an opportunity for young people to say, look, there's a demand for, for, for that there. But let's take, an, let's take a look at, at our region and see some of the things that we have done together. So you have, you have two prongs outside of economics that are important to, our, 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 to any economy, um, health and education. With education, we formed UE. We created a regional university because if we did not have UE, you imagine how much more of a brain drain there would be because everybody who had to be educated from a tertiary extent. level would be leaving the region mm -hmm. and the question is how mm -hmm. many would come back. Right. We have been able to capture and actually create a world-class education system so that the question is now, can we replicate this in any way or form with, uh, with health? Mm -hmm. To create an opportunity where in actual fact we are seen as a leading area and maybe the demand um, the two things can happen first of all um, you know we say it's a brain drain but I also, I also take the perspective that in actual fact our biggest export extra regionally is is intellectual is, is, uh, is our human resource and capacity we I mean you, you see West Indians some um, Caribbean people all over the globe mm -hmm. at, at all levels because we are an intelligent people and therefore, there is an opportunity for them to go, but there's, there's two things. There's an opportunity for them to come back mm. even more prepared to, 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 to lead us in whatever field that it is that they've taken on mm -hmm. um, and come back to the region because you often find that happening. But secondly, is there an opportunity for us to, as a region, sit down and look at health the same way we looked at education and find opportunities to create a stronger system that, that, that supports our 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 society, but also provides us a better opportunity for our nurses. Yeah. Is it that we've, um, the, 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 the creation of our better institutions um, have been in the, in the, in, in the um, past decades as opposed to now? We, we heard of cricket earlier in the discussion. Um, People compare our team <laughs> of now with oh, yesteryear. <laughs> you know, we're looking at replicating institutions that have been been successful. Um, uh, where, 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 where do you see? Where do you see this in in, in, in terms of of how we move forward as a, as a region? You want to go? go? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I would say that. CARICOM has not been given enough credit for the tremendous job it has often done in establishing first-class regional institutions. Let, let us look. My brother here spoke about the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice. You know, only f thus far, only four CARICOM countries have signed on 
to the CCJ as their national highest court of appeal. The others are still hanging on to this colonial institution known as the British um, Privy Council. And, and, and when you ask sometimes, well, why is this? Well, we, we have doubts about the, uh, our own institution. But, well, I can tell you something. Um, the CCJ is an absolutely first-class institution, and it is a credit to those Caribbean architects who put that institution in place. First of all, they established this institution with a trust fund of 100 million US dollars. So in other words, the financing of the CCJ is secure. The CCC, CCJ doesn't have to look for any government finding money for, for, for to, to, to yeah. finance its operations. It has its own trust fund run by a very accomplished board of trustees. Um, the CCJ, and because of that, and because of the fact that it has first class um, uh, international um, jurists, um, it has its uh, first class headquarters in, in Port of Spain. And unlike the, the Privy Council, as my brother here said, if you can't get to the CCJ, CCJ, the CCJ will come to you or will even make provision for you to speak to them through video conferencing facilities. Now, it is estimated that for the average Caribbean citizen to access the Privy Council in London, you are looking at, at something like 60 to 70,000 US dollars, right? When all the bills are added up, the costs, of, the costs of retaining English attorneys, the cost of filing, the cost of travel to the UK, the cost of the, the hotel accommodation, all the rest of it. In other words, the Privy Council is a court only for wealthy Caribbean citizens or for murderers, because if you're a murderer on death row, you will get some um, British lawyers who will do the case pro bono. So, but unless you are a murderer on death row, <laughs> or you are a very wealthy Caribbean business person or individual, the CCJ is not, the, the, the Privy Council is not really a court for you. So we have this first class institution that we establish ourselves using our own intelligence and genius and initiative and yet some of us give it short shrift and look down upon it so it is very unfortunate i mean i have a card in my hands here caricom impacts um, the caricom implementation agency for crime and security this is the caricom institution that keeps us safe in this region that looks after the safety and security of, of our region. It, its headquarters is there in, in Trinidad. Uh, and so there are so many institutions. I mean, some were mentioned, the CDB. Where would we be? Where would so many of our countries be were it not for the Caribbean Development Bank? You know, it's, not, it's an associate institution of CARICOM. CARDI, uh, I mean, the, uh, this, and some recent ones. The, um, the CARICOM, the Caribbean Center um, for, on Climate Change, yeah. or the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, yeah. or the Caribbean Regional Organization for Standards and Quality. And we can, we can go on and on. And virtually all of these are very high quality organizations. Yes. Yeah, so I think it is one of the things that we like to emphasize that CARICOM is not the CARICOM secretariat. It's something we need to repeat because a lot of people think that it's that construct in Georgetown that is CARICOM, but we, the member states and the bodies that help to implement um, the agreements that the member states make a part of the overall CARICOM construct and a number of institutions have been created to facilitate the um, specialized areas of development that the countries of the region want to work on together and uh, you heard you have heard about about some of them 
Uh, I'm going to come to you, Mr. Kweko, but I also want us to, um, to, to remind our viewers about some of the, the benefits of, of uh, free movement, what, 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 um, what is involved, what has been uh, proved for them, and especially in recent times, because as I mentioned earlier, and I wanted to get back to it, uh, it, it, it is one of the areas of, of interest that our people have because, of course, the opportunities that are being created are for them, and it's, um, these are opportunities that would go beyond their, their national, national borders. So the whole concept of, of movement of people and what are the benefits, Mr. Gregor. Well, I was preoccupied with um, the CCJ. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. in terms of the way forward mm -hmm. because we need to have all member states on board in terms of the CCJ. Now, on fort there's a big challenge at this point in time. Unfortunately, some member states must have a referendum before right. going to the CCJ right. according to their constitution. Right. I think we had, we had two in countries Grenada. doing recently um, and, Antigua. Antigua. and Antigua Party. Yeah. So which means that while we are putting those things in place to benefit the citizens, but the citizens, maybe they are not aware, yeah. that's why they are voting against going to the CCJ. It's voting against their best interests. Exactly. And I've been, I have been trying to work this, I've been talking to people about why, why is it happening? Because I followed the, the campaign in Antigua. It was, it was an excellent campaign. Yeah, so, so did I. It was an excellent campaign. And I was shocked when um, the people voted no. Yeah. So that is a challenge for us. Yeah. How uh, do we proceed? <laughs> yeah. uh, I think public education. I, I well, think enough of our people don't know about the, first of all, many of our people don't even know about the existence of some of these CARICOM institutions. Yeah. And um, if they know about them, they don't know about their stellar record. So I think that CARICOM has, we, because we are CARICOM, we have a responsibility to ourselves to really tell our story yeah. and make sure every single citizen of the Caribbean knows that story. Yeah. And, uh, but if I could just touch on the freedom of movement, um, the, the I am, I am a big, big fan of this CARICOM Skilled Nationals program okay. because I think that it, is, uh, it gives you a leverage to motivate your young people to say to them, look, in a world in which people are putting up walls, some, some want to put up physical walls, okay. some are putting up regu walls of regulations, but they're putting up walls to keep out people like you. They don't want you. The only space that is taking, taking down barriers and saying, look, we are creating this common regional space for you is the Caribbean community. And our leaders are saying to you, the young people of the Caribbean, look, take your education and training seriously. Because if you take it seriously, you go and get that, certif uh, that certificate. Get yourself certified. And on the basis of that certification, you can get your CARICOM Skilled National Certificate. And once you get that, you can go into any of 14 of the 15 CARICOM countries. Because the only one that isn't part of the, um, this arrangement is the Bahamas. But any of the others, you can go in there, present your CARICOM Skills Certificate, get the right to work to reside and work indefinitely without the need for any work permit without the need for permission from anyone in in that country and you could get this right in several caricom countries in other words the this caricom region now becomes your oyster this becomes your space um, to search out your destiny to search out um, your um, life advantages to find yourself to advance but it begins with you taking your education okay. seriously it begins with you um, getting that certification so i think it's something 
It's a program that we can use right across the region to lift educational and training levels and lift the cultural and educational standard of our people and, um, and give real benefits, real tangible benefits, especially to our young people. And gentlemen, I can attest to, to, to this from a real world experience mm -hmm. um, because my group has, over the last five years, had um, employees, technical employees, um, from Dominica and from Jamaica through this program where the, 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 the need for work permits is, is voided because they have um, um, certified with their, their, their skills mm -hmm. um, um, certificates mm -hmm. and they were able to come down and provide mm -hmm. an opportunity for us, a, a solution for us and an opportunity for them, I should say, um, at employment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it can work. Yes. As we, as we wind down the discussion, um, maybe um, you can expand on that a bit more, Mr. Mr. Gordon, in terms of uh, the practical side of uh, this um, free movement um, and how it is likely to, to benefit the, um, the skill sets that um, companies can draw on mm -hmm. as they seek to expand and make um, and, and, um, and uh, and widen their own business operations. Well, as I, as I said earlier, that has to obviously work in tandem with the, um, the governments um, pushing and promoting a complete free movement of, of persons because it has to be able to, to be at all levels. I think that the, the last drive was to bring it um, to the level of um, um, agricultural workers, agricultural workers and security. Um, security. Guards, yeah, so and I still think there are still yeah. 12 categories. So far, the yeah, 12 so categories, yeah, um, three of them we're still grappling with, agreeing on the definition, mm -hmm. but there are 12 approved yeah. categories. Um, categories thus far. Mm -hmm. But what happens now is that when you bring the private sector to the table right. um, and they make a commitment, because they literally made a verbal commitment um, to, to endorse and to utilize this opportunity, it is now for, um, and that is what we do well it's in terms of trying to be efficient and effective to sit down and ad identify okay where are the opportunities that this can create can, can, can be derived how do we structure the opportunities um, um, in terms of creating a, a regional footprint or, or a database of, of, of demand versus supply of, 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 of capacity and, and jobs and how we put it together. These are the things that the, the private sector will take a stab at to make sure mm -hmm. that it maximizes as long as it knows that, because what, what a company w w doesn't want is red tape and confusion. You know what, you want to know that you can pick up the phone and if you need, as I said, the gentleman is looking for 12 or 15 engineers mm -hmm. and you can, you, can, you can arrange that in a matter of a week or two and have your employees, as long as they're willing to move um, and you're creating them uh, equally um, satisfactory opportunity in your in your area that they can pick up and go as long as that is satisfied by you what the, what the operator wants to know the private sector person wants to know is that the red tape is not going to outweigh the benefits okay. and therefore as long as the the red tape is removed we will work as um, as an entity to try and make sure that we can manage and meet um, the opportunities to the, the capacity across the region. Okay. So essentially saying, and in, in, in summarizing, the efforts made today and in the past, um, that you're seeking to have the, the private sector as a grouping, mm -hmm. speaking with the one voice, um, engaging directly um, more and more with, um, with the, the, the heads of government of, of CARICOM and seeking to um, to, to find a mechanism to work together. Absolutely. This, this opportunity, if afforded us, puts us at the table. Um, so the direct discussion, uh, and furthermore, if we, if we create our headquarters in Barbados, it puts us at the head table also of, of CSME. 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 Yes. So there is an opportunity CSME for- CSME unit. That, that, that's CSME right, unit. yes. Right. So it, it, it puts us um, in close proximity with them. Mm -hmm. So it right. now gives us the capacity to directly start to interact because um, right now what, whatever we, we do is what um, is drilled down or pushed down coming out of, uh, out of CARICOM. Mm -hmm. Now we are part of 
of the process right. and our feedback hopefully will be um, will be much more um, required and requested as things are being developed and we will have input into how things are implemented because you know I would like to think that 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 one of the things that the private sector does well is efficient um, execution mm -hmm. and that's what makes um, that's what makes those that are successful successful right. and therefore if we can if, if the CARICOM community can can leverage that capacity mm -hmm. to the benefit of both parties, mm -hmm. then it's a win-win situation. What do you see improving? Uh, I was going to yeah, make a point. <coughs> I am so happy that we've, in, we've embraced the, the private sector in, in the machinery. Because I've been to quoted meetings and Quoted has made decisions Council for in trade and economic development. development. Yeah. Council okay. Yeah. Take decisions without the private sector there. Mm -hmm. And those decisions impact on the on the work of the private sector. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've had litigation as a result of some of those decisions. But so now you have the private sector working together with the with the with quoted from the start of the process be they were at the table now, okay. one other thing um i think um charles mentioned it we have been trying to get to get a labor information system in place for a long time i don't know david if you have any recent update on that but i don't believe we have completed that exercise every time that comes up there's always an issue somewhere but that labor that labor um, information system would help the private sector in terms of what jobs are available, where the human resource is, and we can, you know, mm -hmm. dovetail better. So I'm so happy, you know, because even um, in my work, we've had several workshops where uh, on the EDF, 10th EDF, 11th EDF, well, not 11th yet, where we, we present to the private sector what we think uh, would be goodies for them. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you know. they, do, they come and tell you what the way. We know so that. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, you, know, you know, sometimes you yourself view big statements um, based on the information you have. And then after you see the business sector and you, you try to dog them because you have not delivered. I yeah. mean, as you know, as a group. But I think, I think what we are doing, what we are seeing here, what is manifesting mm -hmm. here with this private sector, um, regional private sector body now being brought on board as an associate institution of CARICOM is that we are perfecting our, structure, our planning structures. Right, you right. see, I think yeah. some of the frustration we have had in, in CARICOM over the years is that our structure for planning was not sufficiently well developed. Now, you can't have a, a, a properly developed structure for planning if you only have government and, and, and public servants at the table. Right. Now that we, ha we have brought, we are now bringing private sector to that planning table, right. we must remember as well that the, we, are, we are also bringing labor yeah, to well, that planning right, table right. because um, the heads of government agreed to also make the regional labor organization an associate institution. Right. So the Caribbean Congress of Labor, just as the private sector organization will now be sitting at the planning table, the representatives of the labor movement will also be sitting at that planning table. So I think we are, we are on our way to correcting mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. of the major deficiencies in the CARICOM architecture, and that is we are now firming up mm -hmm. this planning mechanism. So no longer should we have the kind of situation <laughs> where um, Brother um, Felix in vacuum, right? is I speaking about, know. where you know, the, the governments and the public servants go ahead and do the planning, right. and then the private sector says, but wait, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something is missing from this. Right. Now they will be at the table to oh. make their direct Absolutely. input into the planning process. Absolutely. And so what, what say, five years down the road, difference do you see this um, change of approach making in the way that the region does business? How do you see it benefiting the... Well, um, certainly it gives the private sector insight as to 
the environment that they work in. Mm -hmm. Because as, as I said before, sometimes things are handed down to you. Unexpected, unbeknownst. And, and undesirable. Now that should cease because we will be, or I should say the private sector will be at the table and allowed to now plan and have a, a greater insight into terms of where the region is going um, and how they then can participate and take um, their, um, their, play their role in taking it in that direction and at the same time benefiting um, to develop and strengthen um, you know, the private, tech, private sector organizations that are in the region. Um, there is also opportunities. We spoke briefly because um, Prime Minister Motley wanted to talk, and I, I look back at my notes, um, Investment Projects Initiative, IPI, that um, she was very clear on, and, and it, it, it goes back to your, your earlier comment that you know our old institutions have been so successful, um, IEUE and, and CARI mm -hmm. and so on, and what, what have we done of late? Here is now once again an opportunity for us to look maybe in a, in a different format. Let's not always think in the same way, but how can we look at it differently? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about areas, potential sector areas mm -hmm. that the private sector can work with the government on. Mm -hmm. Transportation, renewable energy, tourism, agriculture and agro-processing, information, um, technology information, financing, and resilience bonds. So already we have identified uh, uh, three of them, three or four of them were identified. We've expanded them to so things that we feel that um, we can bring capacity to um, potentially. And this is all potential, but and, and it has to go, go forward with discussion. But maybe those are areas now in the new paradigm mm. that we can start looking at, at, at participating and creating much more resilient um, entities that are mm. going to mirror that of UE, etc. Yes. And when the private sector does that, that's a new frontier, because th yeah. those are things that we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to wean our, our, ourselves off of fossil fuels, and we need to put renewable energy infrastructure in place yeah. all across the region. We know that we have, we have needed for a long time a system of maritime transportation Absolutely. so that we can move goods and people up and down our, our territories um, efficiently and cheaply we know that we need our own cnn of the of the caribbean community to share news and information on a 24-hour a basis so those are that's like the new frontier of development but things that we have needed for a long time and the new thinking is that maybe if we now have the private sector and labor at the table to plan them and to also be involved in their implementation because if you're part of the planning it makes it easier now for you to be involved mm -hmm. in the implementation. But as we put those new frontier um, entities in place, that is also going to open up new life opportunities for our people. Yes. You know, uh, it, it is going to give them a more diversified and powerful um, social environment in which to express express themselves and this is why I come back ultimately the, the 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 rationale the fundamental rationale for Caribbean integration is to provide avenues for social transformation and, and social mobility and upliftment is not just about narrow yeah. it's about changing human lives mm -hmm. it, it is about giving our people access to opportunities and possibilities mm -hmm. that they would otherwise not have if they were simply restricted to their little separate island um, territory and society. Yeah. And I just want to point out as well that there are very clear working examples of, of private-public partnership um, collaborations that have worked very successfully. I'm, I'm, you know, um, two that I, that, that I am aware of or are, for example, the, the the bullet train system that operates in Japan mm. is a private-public um, partnership. Okay. And this now has revolutionized transportation across Japan. Um, it is very efficiently run, but um, it's done so um, to the standards and expectations of the public um, demands, but um, it also allows the private party 
to be able to benefit financially from providing that, that facility. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another one in um, Hong Kong. I think one of the, um, um, the, I think there's a bridge and a tunnel that, that, that mm -hmm. both go across from Kowloon to, mm -hmm. um, to the mainland. And one of them is a private, is a private um, operation. So there are opportunities where you can provide public good um, using the private um, initiative and be successful and provide an economic mm -hmm. benefit to all. Mm -hmm. And those are those are far-reaching examples. So let's let's mm -hmm. let's create our own within mm -hmm. the region, mm -hmm. with and, and especially as as um, as we know that every day we wake up, um, technology is changing and advancing and taking taking us in new directions. So there's so much more opportunity um, that can be um, can be um, grabbed today if we um, put our collective heads together. Mm -hmm. yes, certainly, gentlemen. This was a very rich discussion. We'll wrap in a moment but final words let me begin with you mr Cuervo. well i'll basically want to remind people that carry festa will be held in trinidad and tobago next month and that's another vehicle by which we unify the um the region and we showcase our talent uh, our businesses as well so i'm putting a plug for for the um for caricom uh, in terms of advertising Carrie Fester, which is be to be held in Trinidad next month. Yes, <laughs> yes certainly. Um, <laughs> it, it does sound like you'll be there. Um, the specific dates, the 16th to the 25th of August. And uh, I know that uh, uh, St. Lucia would be among the countries there. That signal has come already, so I'm sure there's a lot to, for the audience to look forward to in terms of the cultural display, but so too would be the, um, we're looking forward to all CARICOM member states being there and participating. Judging from the preparatory work, there's quite a lot to look forward to. It's, it's quite a range of um, cultural expressions from the culinary to the literary to the performing arts. There should be something in there for, for everyone. Uh, Mr. Charles, final words. Okay, so I will um, do two things. I will, I will um, give a more direct answer to your first question, which I probably skirted around, which was whether or not I got any sense of um, of positive feedback from the from, from, <laughs> from, from the CARICOM heads. And I would say what what we did get was that there was no obvious dissent whatsoever. We know that this is actually a request from from the CARICOM community. So we'd like to think that it, 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 would, it would happen. And everything we've gotten so far has been positive. But um, like Ambassador next to me, I'll put a plug <laughs> and say um, I, I'm hoping that the um, CARICOM heads will, will proceed to endorse us as quickly as possible. We've given a timeline and said that we're prepared um, to com complete all of our negotiations over the next six weeks and to be have a functional functioning um, entity um, by the end of this n of this next quarter. So um, the sooner that we can get all of the necessary green lights, I think there are one who things that have to happen on our end first, which we'll put in place. But the sooner that we can get the green light, the sooner that we can make sure that we have completed the exercise and handed to the CARICOM community, a CARICOM private sector organization that is here at the table to work with CARICOM in making sure that we maximize the potential of our CSME initiative. Yes, excellent. And the final word, Ambassador Commodore. Um, you know, we, we live in a world in which um, many regional integration efforts have come and have gone. In fact, even as we speak, the, the mighty European Union <laughs> is grappling with Brexit. Well, you know, Cari the precursor to CARICOM, um, CARIFTA, was started in 1968. So our integration exercise, we could say we are celebrating 51 years this year. 51 years is a long time. And we don't have any Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> to the credit of CARICOM, it has, its, its, its existence has never been really threatened in any existential manner. No one has broken away, and it is very much intact after 51 years. I know that there are some citizens of the Caribbean who have some skepticism because 
I would say over the past decade or so, CARICOM has, had, has always had its ups and downs. <coughs> and I would say between, say, um, 2008 to, to 2018 was not one of our best periods. But I would say to all of those skeptics, look, do not judge CARICOM just on that recent decade because we can sense um, a, a, new, a new optimism, a new hope, a new dynamism coursing through CARICOM, certainly over this, over this past year. It's, a, it's as if, you know, this is almost a, a fresh taking of guard. And some of, some of the, the evidence of that is this initiatives like bringing the private sector on board, bringing the labor movement on board, expanding the categories of, of, of the skilled national program and so forth. So I, I would say to all Caribbean citizens, take a fresh look at, at, at CARICOM, take a fresh look at, at what is happening now, these very exciting and positive re recent developments, and get on board because we now have our Committee of CARICOM Ambassadors. We have, right across the region, I'm from Barbados, Brother uh, Felix Gregoire from Dominica, and we have counterparts in so many other member states. We are functioning as a committee, and as a committee of ambassadors, we are committed to making this CARICOM project work. We are committed to being the link between what happens at the Secretariat and our national populations, making sure our people are informed and that, that we have a, a, an inclusive process going forward. So something is happening and we need, we need the interest and support of our people. Right. And I'd like to continue that line and encourage you who are viewing to engage your respective ambassadors to find out what's happening, mm -hmm. as so correctly said the, uh, the, the link between the national and the, and the regional. They are aware of what the initiatives are and especially new measures, new directions that uh, as we were discussing today, the embracing of the private sector at the table and also the regional labor movement so that they're part of both the planning and the implementation. So it's for you to keep abreast of what's happening so that you know where the benefits, where the potential benefits lie. Uh, one, one of the areas we didn't um, touch on but relate to free movement has been the move to ensure that contingent rights are enjoyed by the uh, spouses, children of the people who move because it, it, um, it, it, it is a, a bugbear for some people who move and that is so that you enjoy the rights of um, of the person with whom you're moving with. In a, in a practical terms, your children can go to the schools, mm -hmm. your spouse can work. Can, work, can work. Without the work permit. And, and, and that's an important part of, of, of free movement. In terms of the um, new areas that the heads want to add to the categories of free movement, we mentioned um, agricultural workers, that's, that's a one that is being looked at, um, security yeah. officers, and the, the people who deal with um, with hairs, the barbers, yes, and the, yes. and yes. And yes. the beauticians, beauticians, beauticians and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that um, once the the, 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 the the finishing touches have been done with the measures to support those areas, then those categories will move along with the others, like the nurses and teachers who have long been been part of the of the process. So it um, there's a lot to learn, and as I said. Um, we, we had the secretariat, will, CARICOM secretariat will be con always willing. You, we do get quite a lot of questions about um, free movement, that's the area of concern. But as I said, we have the committee of ambassadors um, with ambassadors right in your respective territories who will be able to um, inform you. And we look forward to being able to work along as well once the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed with the regional private sector body and with the regional labor movement. As I said at the start, we organized this panel discussion to be part of the side events around the 40th meeting of CARICOM Heads of Government, now taking place in St. Lucia. And we hope that you, you found it informative. We want to invite you to join our stream again tomorrow 
at about 5 p.m. when we'll have the closing press conference and you'll know what the various uh, outcomes were, what the uh, decisions and agreements that were made based on uh, the agenda for this meeting. So do join us again then. I want to thank the production team from the Government Information Service and UETV for supporting this, uh, this, this discussion. And I want to thank the members of the, the panel for taking the, the time off from uh, the very um, busy schedule associated with a meeting of this nature to uh, share with you this afternoon. My name is Kendall Morgan, Communications Head at the CARICOM Secretariat. And I want to give you, I want to say thanks to you for joining us for this discussion and have a pleasant rest of the day.